Well, good evening. It's an absolute pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Karen Adams, who most of you already know. Uh, Karen got her BA in anthropology from Miami University and a PhD in biology from the University of Arizona. And this dual interest in anthropology, specifically archeology span and botany set the stage for a very long and productive career studying plant remains from archeological sites. The kind of archeological data that too often have been ignored or discounted by most archeologists. Karen has examined, I believe, more collections of plant remains than any other scholar in the US Southwest and Northwest Mexico. She has a profoundly impressive vita of dozens and dozens of very important and seminal uh, archeological reports. There are three in particular that I'd like to highlight very quickly. Early in her career, she worked with Borsilla Bohr on the Salomon Ruin, a major Chaco and excavation. And she not only did a tremendous amount of research, understanding how these people interacted with their plant environment, but also how to systematize the procedures of the study of plant remains, how to take them, how to analyze them. For many decades, she worked, she was the ethnobotanist for Crow Canyon, which you know is one of the most important institutions in, northern, in the Northern Southwest that combines a significant research with significant teaching. And in her capacity is not only to doing research, she has probably mentored in the summer intern, uh, enormous number more students uh, than any other uh, person uh, has mentored in ethnobotany. In addition, in third, I'd like to point out the Proyecto Arqueológico Chihuahua, uh, a work in the central Chihuahua, multi years under Jane, the late Jane and wonderful Jane Kelly. And uh, it was the first project really to provide systematic data, particularly about the pre Casas Grandes or Viejo period. Absolutely important work. And these are just three examples of many. I believe Karen labors under the assumption that the aesthetic appeal. Uh, or size of archaeological artifacts isn't a measure of how important they are about telling us about uh, humanity. That is tiny little burnt seeds, for example, maybe the size of a dot at the end of a sentence, are, can be as valuable as the more widely studied archaeological remains like ceramics or lithics or rock art. I think you'll see in this lecture this evening how Karen's research can tell us much about humanity and the relationship between plants and people. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Adams. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Paul, thank you for those very flattering words. I really appreciate it. Coming from a fellow archaeobotanist, paleoethnobotanist. Um, yeah, you really have to um, love what you're doing. And I always enjoyed looking at the, what I called the Blackburn bits of prehistory, um, sorting them into little piles of uh, uh, like seeds or like uh, wood, and um, eventually interpreting them uh, as best I could. But tonight, what I'd like to talk about is really about plant domestication, which is something we really probably don't think very much about anymore, where our food came from. Uh, who figured out how to tame wild plants uh, and make them the domesticated food products that we all know and love today. And, you know, you ask um, school age children, where does our food come from? And of course, the answer is the grocery store. And they're absolutely right about that. But where does it really come from? And so when you talk about domestication, we usually think about cats and dogs and horses and cows. Domestication is a process, uh, it's defined as taking something into the household, basically taming a wild plant or animal. And what we're really doing is taking the variability that nature fosters. Nature loves variability because it gives her the edge if anything goes wrong. There's always some plants or animals out there that are gonna make it through the, the worst of uh, what the world has to throw at it. But um, we don't like that kind of variability. We don't want our wheat grains uh, heart, um, ripening over an eight week period. We want them all ripe at the same time so we can um, swoop them in. And um, 
So it's going from variability to uniformity um, and conformity, which is what we humans prefer. Actually, the um, range of human plant interactions is a, a continuum from um, harvesting wild plants back in our history, uh, way back in our history, to tolerating some of them, to encouraging others, to actually managing plants at some level, uh, actually cultivating them, which is essentially planting them in the ground and uh, watching over them, and eventual domestication, basically taming them uh, to uh, produce the products that we want. Sometimes the products are uh, larger, sometimes they taste better, sometimes they ripen earlier. There's a lot of different uh, traits that can be managed by humans during the domestication process. And of course, the epitome of plant domestication is seedlessness. So um, seedless grapes, seedless watermelons, and corn, maize, zea maize, that must be husked in order to release the kernels. Um, those are the height of domestication. Those plants are really helpless without humans. So humans have managed those to the point of complete dependency. So what I'm gonna talk about tonight is something about the what, where, and when of plant domestication. The first uh, part of my talk, I will show you some of the plant parts that have been domesticated. Humans have figured out how to uh, domesticate every plant part imaginable. This has happened on all the major continents of the world except for the cold ones. Uh, it goes all the way back about 13,000 or so years up to fairly recently in the 1930s. The kiwi was domesticated in China, so we haven't given it up yet and we could still be doing it if we wanted to. And all of these plants, many of these plants, at least those the ones all but the ones that were lost in prehistory for one reason or another are, are what's on your plate uh, every time you sit down to a meal. So I'm gonna just give you a little brief um, uh, reminder of the parts of a plant. Okay, so this is your um, average everyday plant. It's got uh, underground roots. It's got a main stem. Then you can see that it's got, a, it's got leaves. And at the top, to the top left, you'll see that it's uh, a leaf blade and a leaf petiole. And then you've got in the little notch where the leaf petiole joins the main stem, they, it's called an axle. So you can have a little bud in there that's eventually going to be another uh, stem with flowers and fruits. You've got the, the terminal bud on the top. And you've got a flower which eventually will turn into fruit and the fruit will have seeds. So all these different parts have been of interest to humans uh, over the last um, 12 or 13,000 years. And so here are some examples. A uh, head of lettuce is actually a terminal bud. So it's the very top of the plant and it would keep opening up and elongating and making more stems, more leaves, more flowers and fruits. Brussels sprouts are in the axles of the stems, in the little notch between um, the leaf petiole and the stem. So Brussels sprouts are basically axillary buds. Okay, leaf blades turn out to be leaf lettuce and spinach. Leaf petioles, the petiole again is the little stalk that the leaf blade sits on. That's given us a uh, celery and rhubarb. When you Think about stems, you tend to think about stems as being above ground parts. So an asparagus um, that you cook up for dinner is a, a complete stem, but you really don't realize that sometimes stems are below ground. And in the case, uh, and they, they serve usually as storage org organs. And so a below ground stem uh, is a yam. So it, at uh, Thanksgiving, when you're cooking yams, you're cooking up below ground stems. Uh, roots, of course, this one's pretty easy. Carrots and radishes uh, are roots that have been uh, tamed and domesticated by humans over time. Uh, flowers, artichokes, and uh, heads of broccoli and cauliflower are young flowering heads. They would eventually, if left to their own devices, 
uh, literally flower and, and fruit. But of course, we pick them very, very young when they're very immature. Fruits are fleshy, like apples and plums um, and apricots, and dry, like grains and nuts. And so there are a wide range of fleshy and dry fruits uh, that uh, serve as human foods today. Seeds, of course, are, are ultimately what gets planted and germinates uh, to form the next plant. And beans and lentils are all good uh, examples of seeds, as are coffee. They call them beans, but they're really coffee seeds. What would we do without coffee? So where did this happen? Well, basically, all the major continents of the world except the cold ones, okay? So most of the continents have um, a host of examples of plants that humans some, at some time in their past uh, have domesticated. And um, so all the foods we eat today have come from one of these continents. They, we have what <clears throat> are considered centers of origin. There are certain <clears throat> excuse me, consider it hotbeds of domestication activity where people figured out domestication pretty early on, thousands of years ago in, these, in many cases. And, and once they domesticated one plant, then they just kept going. They might have done many plants because they figured out how to have some um, level of control over plants. And so, but these hotbeds of domestication are places like the Near East, uh, the Mediterranean, China and Southeast Asia, uh, in the New World, Mesoamerica, Southern Mexico and Central America, and um, lesser known centers um, with smaller numbers of plants that were domesticated are North America and Ethiopia. And I listed in North America some of the plants that have been historically domesticated and in the prehistoric era as well. Historically, people uh, tamed wild rice, pecans, and a wide range of berries, blackberries, raspberries, blueberries, cranberries, strawberries. In the prehistoric era, um, this is interesting, a plant called sumpweed. Um, I'm sure if I suggested I was going to serve you sumpweed for dinner, you'd say, no, thank you, please. But sumpweed is actually in the um, uh, composite family, the sunflower family, and it's got little seeds that are somewhat similar to sunflower seeds. So you probably eat it. Ragweed, canary grass, sunflowers, goosefoot, and little barley, which I'll talk about in more detail later, were all North American prehistoric domesticates. Uh, some of these made it uh, all the way to uh, the historic period. M many did not. So um, and of course, Africa offered us okra, coffee, watermelon, and sorghum. I'm completely appreciative of coffee. The others I like too, but what would we do without our morning cup of coffee? So the time periods for this basically almost up to 13,000 years ago. And we know all this that I'm talking about to you because of archeology. span it's the archeological record of these plant parts in different times and different places that have uh, laid out this story of human interaction with plants to the point of domestication over this very long time period. And this story changes continuously. So um, anything I say today may be slightly out of date tomorrow, but uh, we're really talking about the Neolithic period it's uh, the second from the left, 10,000 to 12,000 years ago when this got started. So it says agriculture begins. And uh, once people uh, figured out agriculture, it changed the way they could live. They could produce enough of their food to be able to store it. And, and then they could concentrate on other things like building societies. and um, and inventing writing and uh, all the things that come with uh, what we know as civilized societies today, they probably couldn't have been done easily unless people had a secure food supply that they had control of. So the Neolithic was pretty darn important to, the, to, the, to us today and for the last 10 to 12,000 years to everybody who came before us. All right, so my contention is that any plate of food 
that any of us eat at any meal will represent um, the diversity of these long-standing human-plant relationships. Any plate of food you take can come from different parts of the world, been domesticated at different times, represent different plant parts. So that's really what this particular lecture is all about. So um, you might ask, how does domestication work? Who figured this out? Well, you know, people were hunters and gatherers for a long period of human history. And so they would go out and gather wild plants. That was what they ate. Animals too. I'm only representing the plant world tonight, but uh, a lecture like this could certainly be done for animals as well. So, so just think that people are out gathering wild plants. It could be men, it could be women, it could be everybody in the family. And somebody notices something in a wild population that is appealing. And possibly it might be something like uh, one little stand of a wild grass um, matures much earlier than all the rest of them. Or the grains are bigger. Or in another case, it might be some greens that they're picking to cook up like spinach that are less bitter. They don't have to process the bitterness out of them. Could be any particular thing, but they see that and they kind of concentrate on it. They pull it out of the wild, and maybe because they like it so much, um, that they they return to that patch, or they even encourage that patch. Maybe they throw a few seeds out, so they'll get more of it next year. So it it starts with a very casual relationship, and, and then it gets more complicated from there. And so this behavior was the beginning of giving us the domesticated foods we eat now. And the example that I've got on the bottom of this slide is fairly interesting. This is about corn, zea maize, maize, maize. Uh, it's a really important worldwide crop today for humans um, as food, for animals as food, for uh, biofuels. I mean, this is, this is, this is a biggie and it's a new world domesticate. And to the lower left, you can see that the wild plant that gave rise to the corn ear is called teosinte. And teosinte is a, is a grass, um, uh, a new world grass. And it, the way that it grows, it grows with these little cupulet fruit cases stacked one on top of the other. So what happens is the top uh, little cupulet fruit case ripens and falls off and then the rest fall in succession and down the bottom. And that's how the plant um, operates in the wild. But somehow people um, in the new world, about 10 to 12,000 years ago, started planting and harvesting that plant. And on the right, you can see the, the little teosinte at the top, uh, a hypothesi hypothesized intermediary form in the middle, and then the ear of corn we know today at the bottom. So whole careers have been um, made over arguing over how this happened. How could you have gone from this little teosinte plant with these cupulet fruit cases step, stacked one on top of the other to what we know as modern corn today? I'm not gonna claim I can answer that, but that's what happened. And, um, and so some of these domestications have been extremely important uh, for humans. And some of these selection pressures on wild plants are conscious. People are consciously choosing some, something. In the case of you see wild apples on the left and domesticated apples on the right, everything about them is the same except there's much more fruit, fl fruit flesh on the domesticated apple. So people were consciously selecting for bigger fruit. So that's pretty straightforward. You can understand that. But then there are unconscious selection pressures. And so, no, we're not all asleep at the wheel. But what that really means is um, that something about the system of harvesting the plants causes a change in the population. So what I have here is a field of wild tansy mustard plants. And these are not domesticated, but let's pretend like they're, they're very high in fat, uh, lots of good calories. It takes very little effort to harvest them. So if I were to walk through this field 
on one day in May and, and, and bang at the heads and get a big bag of tansy mustard seeds and then throw them out next year to ensure another good harvest. Just by walking through that field in May, I have, I have collected the ones that were ripe at the time. I didn't get any of the ones that were ripe before then and have already fallen to the ground. And I didn't get any that were ripe after that. So this, unco this unconsciously narrows the range of when these seeds are going to make plants and be available to harvest. So that's an unconscious selection pressure. And those went on as well as those conscious ones where people were intentionally making choices. So an old, an interesting old world example, you, you saw this in the little write-up in glyphs. This is a great example. One plant, one plant in the Mediterranean, Brassica oleracea, gave us all these different food products. Cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, kale, broccoli, and cauliflower. So you could see just different parts were being selected for. Now, if you like one of these, you probably like them all because it's the mustard family and they have a little tanginess sometimes. But so if you like them, one, you like them all. If you don't like one, you probably don't like the rest of them. In the new world, this is just another example. In this case, Cucurba de Pipo, <clears throat> excuse me, was domesticated. And what, what differs in this example is the fruit forms. So it's all the same species, but from this one species, you get the patty pan, uh, the yellow, the pumpkin, the zucchini, and the acorn. <clears throat> so in this, this particular case, it's all the different domesticated fruits that came from one species. 95% of all the calories eaten by humans come from 10 plant families. Um, the grasses are especially important important for all their grains. That's where maize, maize, zea maize is, and rice, barley, oats, wheat, rye. Then um, other families, the palms, the, which have the dates and the coconuts, the Aram family with taro, the yam family with yams, and, and going, going down. Um, notice that I have highlighted and underlined um, some of these that were new world domesticates. Most of these were old world other, uh, on other continents, but maize and quelites and quinoa, beans, sweet potato, potato, tomato, all new world. So uh, once, once, um, once people kind of get the hang of domesticating a plant, um, they'll, they'll probably do other ones as well. But, uh, you know, domesticated foods come from just about every continent. All right, so how do people figure out what's edible in the first place? Okay, so this is where your survival training comes in. All right, <clears throat> first you go out and so you're, you've been dropped off in a place where you don't recognize any of the plants, you're hungry, you gotta figure this out, what are you gonna do? It, basically, it's trial and error. Uh, hopefully, <clears throat> you live through this, but you take a little tiny taste. If it's bitter, if it makes your tongue burn, you spit it out, you just quit there. Um, you know, if you've got a plant that you've picked a leaf off of and you have a bad reaction, then um, don't even mess with it. It's not worth it. But you could, it, but if nothing happens, you could try to take a little bit bigger taste. Maybe you could chew a tiny bit, still spit it out, but just wait and see what happens to your tongue. If it doesn't swell up or, you know, uh, get, get like it's on fire, you know, you're probably okay. Eventually you can swallow a little piece. All right, and again, this is survivalist training. When, when um, military folks are out in the wilderness and they have to eat something, uh, they're kind of given uh, a set of rules on, on how to uh, figure out what would be edible. It's not foolproof, but um, I, I think that probably the smartest thing to do is take good care of all the elders that already have this knowledge. So you don't have to rein, reinvent uh, the wheel when it comes to what foods are edible or not edible. Um, so some plants, we know this again from the archeological record of other parts of the world um, that uh, were domesticated in prehistory, were here for a while and then gone. 
um, plants like rampion, skirret, alexanders, and a case in, as in the U.S. Southwest of little barley, which I'll talk in more detail later. But has anybody eaten rampion before or skirret or alexanders? So this, the idea that, that we just keep accumulating domesticated plants over the long haul is not quite true because we now know for sure that we've lost some that were here uh, back in antiquity. And again, it's the archeological record that reveals that. So how does domestication work? I mean, so here you are, you're a person, uh, a member of a group that's harvesting wild plants and catching animals. And um, so what is it about a particular population of, of a plant that catches your eye? Well, I tend to think that mutations have something to do with this. And we tend to think of mutations as being bad, but I think in many cases, a mutation can um, end in a positive result. So if there was a mutation in, a, in, a, in some wild plants in a population and humans seem to notice it, then uh, they might pull that particular mutation out of the wild and that would be what they um, plant the next Next year and the year after that. And so it's observant humans paying attention to the wild plants that they're harvesting, noticing a few are different. What do I mean by different? Maybe uh, some of the grains uh, come out of, the, uh, out of their little protective bracts easier. Maybe the taste is better. Maybe the uh, maturity is earlier when you're hungry. You need it uh, earlier um, in the season than what it normally is. I mean, it could be one of any number of observations that catch somebody's eye. And, um, and, you, and when those are pulled out and then replanted, you're, you're on your way to a domesticated plant. And again, it's just, it's a mutation is a, is a, a little um, blip in um, some of the base pairs of the double helix. Uh, a little change there might be all it takes to make a difference that's enough to be noticed. It turns out, if you think, if you think this is a crazy idea, they've already, uh, there's already published articles on this. Two of the three sisters, and by three sisters, I mean corn, beans, and squash. Two of the three of them have been studied, and it turns out that single mutations were responsible for some major trait that appealed to humans. In the case of Teosinte, that little cupulet fruitcase plant that was the ancestor of maize, one mutation along the double helix was responsible for the shift, for a shift from a covered to a naked grain. What does that mean? That means the grains, when they're covered, they have all their protective bracts stuck on them, like uh, a, with industrial strength, mastic. You can't get it off. You can't soak it off, you can't rub it off, you can't lightly parch it off, I've tried. Um, so, so you suddenly get a grain that just falls out and is ready to eat. Like, I'd be interested in that if I were out harvesting grains. Um, in the case of sweet corn, they know three different single mutations are what go from a flour or a flint corn to a sweet corn. And we all like sweet corn. Um, and so it's just a sm very small genetic difference uh, between those different varieties of corn. And, and they, they figured out that there were two independent domestication of the common beans, um, the black beans, the pinto beans, um, the, the beans known in the New World as Spaziolus vulgaris, um, one in the Andes and then later in Mesoamerica. So these wild plants, can have mutations. Nature usually selects against some mutations, but humans might like them. And so, for example, sweet corn, who wouldn't like sweet corn? Um, and um, beans that easily come out of the pods, for example, it would just be um, easier to work with them. So, so one might focus on those. So I once did um, an interesting thing. Uh, for a dinner at Crow Canyon Archaeological Center where I used to hang my hat and work with, with all those wonderful archaeologists. Um, one banquet dinner was, uh, I just got, I got the uh, menu and this was the menu and everything in, in red 
is uh, a plant product, okay? And so there were 18 different plants in that one banquet dinner, 18 different plants. There were a lot of other, you know, there was meat and, and um, eggs and things. Um, but so 18 different plants, and I want to show you that one dinner that they represented six different plant parts. So there were seeds. These are, the, these are the same plants that you just saw highlighted in red on that previous slide. There were seeds, there were stems and leaves, grains and other dry fruit, fleshy fruit, stems, just plain stems, and plain leaves. So those were the 18 different um, plant foods representing six different plant parts. And then when you researched where they were domesticated, they came from five different continents. I mean, we're nothing if not eclectic in, in the foods that we choose to eat, uh, very cosmopolitan. So uh, Asia, basically including the Fertile Crescent, India and Southeast Asia, had the most uh, in that one particular meal, eight different um, uh, listed foods. Europe and the Mediterranean had six, North America uh, contributed three, corn, chilies, and tomatoes. South America, one. Uh, notice that tomatoes are in two places there. That's because people still aren't exactly sure. Uh, it seems like they were independent domestications of tomatoes. So whose went first, we're not, we don't know for sure. And then Australia, which gave us basically New Guinea, which gave us sugar. So that meal, uh, those 18 different um, plant ingredients representing six different uh, plant parts came from five continents. Okay, that's pretty good. This is just one banquet meal. And there they are. That's where, uh, where the red dots, my young grandson helped me put this one together. Um, and so it, uh, you can see the parts of the world, all those foods came from for that one banquet meal. And then Take a look at the time periods. Some of these, the oldest is at the top that we had in that particular meal, wheat, 11,600 years old, uh, as far as the domestication went, all the way up to asparagus, which was fairly recently, relatively recent, a couple thousand years ago. And, and you know, uh, this story uh, changes because archeology span continues to go on. So anything I say now is probably gonna be out of date um, before long, but you get the gist of it, that, the, that plants in this particular meal, um, the, it, was, it was representing foods that people had domesticated over a broad range of time periods. And some of them, we don't even know when they were. So they just say these were domesticated in antiquity. Well, that's the best we can do until archeology span can straighten that out a bit. So the take home message here is that any single meal that we eat today represents human plant relationships that include a wide range of plant parts from most or all of the major continents of the world, except for the cold ones, and spanning the last 12,000 years or more of time up to fairly recently. So that's pretty amazing when you think about it, that, um, that, that humans have done this and, and we are the benefactors um, of this long-term long um, set of relationships. So what I'm gonna do now is switch gears a little bit. So with that background, I'm going to talk about um, a little grass in the American Southwest where we live today in the Tucson area and, and in many other places that was domesticated in prehistory and then lost to us. This, we don't have examples of domesticated little barley, it's called little barley grass today. All of the little barley that I've laid eyes on is, is still the wild plant, but um, back in prehistory, and I'll, I'll go through that story now, um, people domesticated it. And I'll tell you what they did to it so that we can recognize it as a domesticate. All right, so um, first of all, um, barley was actually independently domesticated from different plants in both the old world and the new world. So people tend to sometimes 
to some uh, very similar plants, um, no matter what continent they're on. So in the old world, there was a wild barley called Hortium spontaneum that became the barley of our barley soup. And that, the story, uh, as I, the last time I looked, had it being domesticated in the Fertile Crescent, basically, and a second independent domestication on the Tibetan Plateau. Okay, so old world barley, what we know as barley that we can buy today at the grocery store, um, 8,000 years ago was domesticated and it's been around ever since and we still have it. In the new world, Hortium pusillum, this little grass that I've just shown you uh, a photograph of, this one actually has been utilized and probably independently domesticated in the Midwest and Southeast United States, in California, here in the Southwest US in Arizona, and, and we have it in Southwestern Colorado. I'm not gonna say they domesticated it there. It looks to me like that was a, a movement of little barley, domesticated little barley from the Southern Southwest into Colorado. It's, uh, people were trading it up, okay? So you can see archaic period 4,000 or more years ago um, that the stories of little barley are well worked out in various sectors of the United States. And um, so reasonably some of these were independent domestications. Again, you've got your observant humans looking at uh, uh, out there gathering some wild little barley and suddenly they notice that some of the grains fall out easily from one patch. Well, that's gonna be appealing. They are not gonna to have to work at getting the, the, the bracts, the, the pokey little bracts off of the grains that would stick in their teeth, right? So um, they notice it and, and then they save some and plant it back. And that mutation is kind of fixed in um, the crop. So in, in our area, uh, it shows up in sites that are 32 to 2,600 years uh, ago. Uh, Los Morteros in the Tucson Basin, and then in, up closer to the Tonto Basin, the Sunflower Valley site um, has, has it in the late archaic period, domesticated little barley. Then the height of the use in Arizona, at least, was in, during the pre-classic Hohokam period. Between 750 and 1150 AD, little barley, domesticated little barley was um, used regularly, okay? By the time you get to the classic period, the classic Hohokam period, it was on the decline. So it was passing from the scene. Makes you wonder why that is. Was, was it replaced by something else? Um, people, um, was there some problem developing with it that it, it, it wasn't as um, easy to get anymore? Who knows? By the time we get to the historic period, there was no record of little barley use. So little barley, wild little barley is still out there on the landscape and, um, and it, 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 it was domesticated in prehistory and then we lost it from the record. It it's it's, didn't make it to the historic period. So what, how do we know this? Again, in the archeological record, uh, the new world evidence basically are morphological changes. In other words, it looks different, okay? Noticeably different. So basically, instead of having a grain that has all these little pokey bracts still attached uh, to protect it in the wild, um, it's uh, free threshing, it just falls out. Oh, people love that, you know, it's much easier to harvest. So it's having these, what they call hullus or naked grains, that's a clue. Nature, nature doesn't like those, the grains are too vulnerable in the wild. So it's less protection for the grain, <clears throat> excuse me, but it's easier processing for humans. So we're gonna, we're gonna um, pick that mutation out of the wild. Increasing grain size over time. Basically, people um, like bigger because bigger is, is higher productivity, okay, in a grain. So they will always, like we showed the apple, from a wild little apple to a domesticated big apple, 
you just keep picking the biggest examples that every year you're going to be planting again, right? So you pick the biggest seeds you have and you plant those and then they give big seeds and then some of those are even bigger yet. And over time, you, you get uh, increasing grain size. Some rarer morphological changes in the little barley story is from a shattering to a non-shattering rachis. Now, what the heck does that mean? Well, rachis is a stem and, and the seeds um, are, the fruits basically, grains, are um, arranged along the stem from the bottom to the top. And then nature, what she does is she, she um, lets the stem shatter from the top down. So the top one falls off and it ripens first and then the next one down ripens and it falls off. That's her way of dispersing the seeds naturally. Well, um, that's great for nature, but very vexing for human humans who, who don't want to walk up to uh, a, a, a little barley plant and just by touching it, lose all the parts to the ground. They don't want to be picking them up off the ground. So basically, um, you know, they, they watched for the non-shattering rachis, which is not what nature likes, and, and they, at humans, um, focused on that. And it made it easier for them to harvest the barley and keep more of it, okay? And then another uh, interesting change was from a two row to a six row inflorescence. Well, barley way back in its early history uh, was set up to make more grains than it does now. So right now it makes basically, uh, it has these little um, uh, planting units that has uh, a fertile grain in the middle and two sterile on either side. And you, you look at that and you say, well, what's the point of this? Why have the two sterile on either side? Well, way back in evolutionary history, um, the conditions must have been good enough for all the grains to ripen. So it wasn't a single fertile in the middle and two sterile on either side. It was all three fertile, okay? And this, I'm talking solely wild barley way back in time. But as um, at the end of the Pleistocene, as parts of the world warmed up, um, it was, e it was easier for a plant not to have to support so many ripening grains. And so basically barley, wild barley, defaulted to just having one fertile and two sterile. Um, and, but humans can reverse that. All they have to do is pay attention a little bit, find the few plants that still make six, and then those are the ones that they can um, bring into their fold as a, as a crop. And six-road barley is a really important uh, domesticated plant in the world at large these days. Uh, here are some charred hollis grains from one of the lower Verde River sites that I worked on. This is what it looks like. The Blackburn bits of prehistory. I spend my life looking through a microscope at these guys and a lot of other ones too. But um, these are um, uh, two views, the uh, top view and the bottom view, of what these domesticated little barley uh, grains look like uh, from a prehistoric site. And uh, this is just a little two row versus six row. You can see the arrangement is such that uh, clear all the way over on the right, the six row form just has a higher productivity. You walk off with more uh, food product per spike of, of each plant than you do in a two-road form. So people were going to focus on something like that. Okay, so to put my money where our, my mouth is, I talked to friends, uh, Susan Smith, into joining me in wild um, little barley patches uh, up on Perry Mesa. And it's there every year in March and April. And so we have gone looking. What we're looking for are these mutations that I've mentioned before. I think one, you know, a mutation plus an observant human can be the beginning of the domestication relationship. Well, so, so maybe in, in wild little barley populations, I might be able to find uh, some of these natural mutations, just like people might have done in prehistory. Well, we've done a lot of looking, a lot of harvesting, 
I've, I've, I've taken them all apart, looked at them under my microscope. I haven't found any of those mutations yet. That doesn't mean they're not there. And, but maybe my theory is, you know, it's not proven yet. <laughs> it's not even got any support uh, about the, uh, you know, one muta a mutation in nature and an observant human can be, uh, start the road to domestication. But um, so, you know, we'll do it again after a, a nice wet winter rain period uh, when the little barley is still out in uh, the wild little barley is still out. I'm, I think we could find some mutations there. So one of the advantages of little barley is it's a cool season grass. Now that's really good because you've just come through the winter. You've probably eaten a lot of your stored uh, plant resources. Um, not a whole lot's going on in the plant world except little barley uh, is one of the first grasses up and to produce uh, ripe grains and when everything else is scarce. And the food value isn't so bad, you know, 100 grams. So this is the old world barley, Hortium vulgare. Um, you know, 100 grams gives you 350 kilocalories, um, some protein, small amount of fats, a fair amount of carbohydrates. Uh, grasses, grains are so important the world over that, um, you know, um, that's why they were domesticated by so many groups um, in prehistory. So it, but it's cool season nature makes it especially important if you are hungry and you've just come out of the winter season. Now, the next example, and it's the last example, is gonna be a, a wild potato called Solanum jamesii. It's a perennial, it's a pretty little plant, and um, what it forms underground are tubers, little tubers, okay? So that's, that's the size of them, they're very small, uh, but they're potatoes, you know, it's a good carbohydrate resource. They're underground. You have to know where to dig for them, but you look kind of where the plants are and then you dig below the plants. So here is a um, Solanum jamesii, a wild little potato plant, and you can see that the roots have a number of these tubers attached to them. There's about six or seven of them there, I think. So one plant, if you know what the plant looks like and you dig a little bit, you can walk off with a little handful of potatoes. And, and they're very much like our modern potato of commerce, you know, the, the white potatoes and the red potatoes. In the Four Corners area, I mean the Four Corners states, there, we consider it a legacy plant because it is often near and within ancient habitation sites and ancient agricultural fields. And this story has been worked out. It's in Mesa Verde National Park near, near ruins and ancient fields in Chaco Canyon National Historic Park in Chimney Rock National Monument and in Canyons of the Ancient. If you go to those places, you may not realize that you are looking at a plant that was very likely managed by people in prehistory and has remained on that landscape up until now. Okay, and um, so when it's, when it's in and near these sites, uh, sometimes people will go looking for it in nearby areas that don't have archeological uh, manifestations, no, no falling down buildings or, or potsherds or anything. And, it, and it's hard to find it in, in site in areas that have not previously had humans in uh, the prehistoric era. So it's kind of an interesting plant um, in that regard. And this is just a, uh, a photo, the kind of pinkish blobs are areas where uh, a friend uh, has looked and, and he calls them potato hotspots. And so he's found a lot of them, but near, near Mesa Verde National Park and near Chaco Culture, Culture National Historic Park that's where he's finding them. And, you know, we've, we've all looked in non, in areas without archaeological sites and aren't having much luck finding them there. So um, it's an interesting association. And this is just another view of that, um, just looking solely at Mesa Verde National Park. Okay, so it, sometimes in archaeology we rely on plausibility arguments. Basically, it, it kind of makes sense. Um, that it's not evidence. 
But here are some of the plausibility arguments for these little potatoes. So first of all, uh, size. It turns out that you can have mutant potatoes. Uh, maybe some of you know that. I'll show you a picture of a mutant potato in a minute. But what if somebody was digging up these little tiny potatoes at the end of these little roots of this Solanum jamesii plant, and they found a mutant? They might be immediately interested in it. And then that one, could they could cut up, cut it up, plant the, replant the eyes, and get nothing but mutant potatoes, which are big potatoes. Now, it can be grown outside of their normal range. Somebody could put these little potatoes in their pocket, walk north or east or west, and um, take them out and, and likely get them to grow. Um, I know that because we gave some from um, the Chaco Canyon area to a friend. He took them to Utah and he grew them there. So, you know, and they apparently overwintered just fine in the ground at his house. So you could move these things out of what is their normal range and, and actually get them to successfully grow. Now, potatoes have uh, dormancy, uh, sometimes documented this particular one up to 14 years. So um, that's a real advantage for humans. So if you had these potatoes in a, in a pottery jar, um, they could stay there for a while and you could still plant them uh, potentially up to four, 14 years later. So um, uh, that's a real uh, advantage when you think about it. The nutritional value of these little potatoes is better than our potato of commerce, which is called Solanum tuberosum. Our potato of commerce is pretty much the carbohydrates, but uh, the nutritional value of these little wild potatoes is better. And I'll show you the next slide, I'll show you that. And in the ethnographic record, of Native American groups in the American Southwest that uh, was uh, information gathered um, from the time really that uh, they, you know, people came to the New World from the Old World. They started writing down things. The ethnographic record shows that these potatoes are still known to indigenous groups in the American Southwest today and have been used continuously probably um, from the prehistoric period. So here we are, um, some normal sized um, little potatoes on the left, and then a tuber mutant. Somebody could do a movie about this, uh, <laughs> mutant potatoes uh, get out of control and um, terrorize uh, the citizenry. Um, this is um, a plot that I gave uh, Jim Allison, an archeologist in the Four Corners region, um, uh, some potatoes to take um, from basically the Chaco Canyon area. It went 300 miles northwest into Provo, Utah, where Jim lives. He planted them in his yard and they're doing fine. And I'm sure they overwintered well. Uh, so you can carry these things in your pocket for long distances. And, and as long as you have a long enough growing season, you, you would be able to get them to flower, uh, fruit at the top, and then as they die back, they put their energy back into the tubers underground, and, and they would overwinter underground, and you wouldn't even have to dig them up until you're ready to eat them. And this particular map is the USDA um, range of uh, Solanum jamesii. So it's all the green, so the natural range is the uh, southeastern Utah, a little bit of Colorado, fair amount of Arizona, lots of New Mexico, and then Look up in upper Colorado, that little green splotch that's up towards the top of Colorado, and look in Texas, way to the east. Like, what are those doing there, one wonders. Strikes me as someone may have carried them there and tried them out. This is just from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, their uh, USDA plants database. They're just recording where people have um, uh, found these things and uh, turned the information in. So interesting. Um, and um, one uh, fellow that was really enamored of studying potatoes, his whole career was based on studying potatoes, he was able to keep this little wild Solanum jamesii tubers in cold storage for 14 years and they still sprouted after that. So um, they have longevity, uh, which would be a good thing. If, if you're hungry people, you've, you've got them, 
um, you you might have to you know pull them out at some point if if times are getting tight and they would they would still um, make plants for you and make more tubers underground and here's the nutritional value <clears throat> the James E I is on the left in black and the modern potato of commerce is on the right in green and you can see that uh, the James E I this little wild potato has twice the protein. Um, and more potassium and more calcium. And um, it's pretty good. Wild, wild plants um, can be better than the domesticated ones that we uh, eat every day. And here's the ethnographic record talking about this little wild potato use. It's among the Hopi, the Tewa groups of the Rio Grande, the Navajo, <clears throat> and the, um, some of the other um, Pueblos of Isleta, Acoma, and Laguna. So all of these um, uh, ethnographers uh, visiting these groups um, in the early 1900s, early to mid 1900s, recorded the use of this little potato by these existing uh, Native American groups. So they they know them and and they eat them. Um, and uh, the archaeological evidence is um, is minimal. There are two examples of these tubers that I know of. One is at Pueblo Bonito in Chaco Canyon, and one is at Batatican in Navajo National Monument. So they actually have tubers that were found in these, uh, all shriveled up, but they, they were found in these two sites. When you think about the other parts of the plants, the seeds or the pollen grains, they are not easily distinguished from other closely related um, genera in the potato tomato family. So you can't really tell um, these potatoes apart on the basis of their seeds or their pollen grains. Um, people have, have studied the starch grains on stone tools like manos and matates, and they're fairly certain at a place called Potato Valley. Now, wonder what plant grows there in abundance, right? I bet I know. Um, in Escalante, Utah, um, there is a 10,900 year old um, sighting uh, situation that was written up in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences a few years back um, that the starch grains of this potato were uh, on these um, grinding tools. And so, you know, the, the evidence, um, we get it where we can, we're archeologists uh, uh, and uh, we're happy when we get it, but it looks like this little tuber was important in prehistory. Now, um, so I've just told you about two stories of Southwest US plant domestication, all the way, um, or management, <clears throat> little barley, based on morphological evidence, we're fairly certain was domesticated in prehistory in the American Southwest. The wild potato, we think it was being managed. <clears throat> the contemporary distribution in association with archeological sites is kind of an important clue. It's at the edge of its natural range. So it's been pushed out of its range, probably by people taking them north or west or east in their pockets. And, and just uh, these plausibility arguments, it's, they've got so much going for them. They can have long periods of dormancy. They're easily transported. They, they have some nutritional value and the ethnographic record uh, of Native American groups uh, in the historic era supports the use of these. So, um, you know, they're pretty good stories actually about these two, two plants. And, and both have been published. Um, we can um, we can see that you get this these um, references if you want them. But uh, Paul Menes uh, was the editor for a wonderful book on um, uh, new lives for ancient and extinct crops, and so there is a chapter on the little barley in that book. And then um, in the Journal of Ethnobiology, um, some of us three three of us published the story of the little wild potato, Solanum jamesii. Um, we pulled together all the information we could. So both of these stories uh, on these two plants 
are published and um, are available. So I will round this up by saying any dinner, your dinner tonight has um, an incredible history of human plant relationships that span time and space uh, and include all the different parts of plants and, and these relationships uh, that humans have developed with plants um, in the form of domestication um, over, over time. So uh, think about that the next meal you eat. Just wonder how many different plant parts, how many different continents, how, what time frame uh, might there be in this, in this meal that I'm eating, eating tonight? Okay, well, I'm, I'm ready for questions, if there are any questions. Well, thank you so much, Karen. That was, that was a wonderful presentation. <laughs> thank you. Um, I do have a couple of questions for you. Okay. Uh, um, first, uh, you listed ragweed on an early side, slide that you had. Is this the same ragweed that drives me crazy with its pollen? And also the sugar you listed as coming from Australia and New Guinea, was that cane or beet sugar? Um, ragweed, yes, it is the one that drives you crazy. Sorry, sorry to have to tell you this, um, but it did have edible seeds in prehistory. So um, I, I don't know, they were either not allergic or they just dealt with it. A and the sugar is basically cane sugar. That was the sugar I was talking about from um, New, uh, the southeastern um, part of the world, yeah. Um, have you eaten the wild potatoes? And if so, how do they taste? You know, uh, I have tasted them and, and they can be a little bitter. So you have to kind of mash them up and soak them in water to uh, let the bitterness uh, kind of get out of them. And maybe that's why people have been boiling potatoes forever because they can be a little bit bitter, especially if uh, they've started to photosynthesize and turn green. That, that, that makes them less appealing. Um, so yes, they are edible. They're kind of bland like potatoes. Um, but, um, and, and if they're green, you really have to um, kind of deal with that if there's any green spots on them. Okay. Right. I have a question for you. Um, was there a plant that shows up in the archeological record during the Hohokam period after the little barley disappeared that may have oh. uh, ripened in March, April, and may have that nutritional value? That yeah, no, it's a really good question. Why, why are these plants lost? Yeah. I mean, through history, we, I already talked, rampions, skirret, alexanders, plants that were domesticated elsewhere, gone from the scene. Uh, yet little barley is gone from the, the scene. Um, it almost seems like it might have been a replacement. Something else came along that they liked equally as well or even better, might have been easier to process, uh, might have had other advantages. Um, if, if it did, we, we've, we haven't nailed down what it would have been, okay? But um, plants, uh, domesticated plants have come and gone in human history since, uh, since people really started managing, managing plants. Uh, 12, 13,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, uh, it's all in the archeological record. You, you ask yourself, well, this was perfectly edible and serviceable, so why did they give that one up? Um, you know, I, there's probably a lot of different reasons, really. Yeah. Okay, um, I don't see any other questions right now. There's a couple of comments from Joanna, excellent presentation, thank you. And Elizabeth, brilliant talk, thanks so much. Um, oh, anyone else have a question? Uh, if they do, we'll go there. Otherwise, thank you. Oh, wait. Oh, another brilliant talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question from Ian who says, um, where do you find evidence? Fires, middens, where? Um, fires are you, yes. Uh, Hars, um, um, fire pits, they're pretty good places. If something gets charred, it, it really renders it of, of uh, no appeal to degrading organisms. So once something gets charred, it, it, if, we, if it's still there, if it hasn't you know, uh, been impacted in some way otherwise, it uh, has a good chance of being found. So 
yes, it, it, is, it is the thermal features, we call them, the HARs, the uh, roasting pits. Um, but it's also the trash. It's also the middens because the trash gets tossed into the middens and then more trash gets tossed on top of that. And some of this stuff can be buried for, um, you know, hundreds of years and still be perfectly visible. It's charred. And so I talk about the charred black burned bits of prehistory. That, that's been my life, looking at these charred bits under the microscope. And, um, but they are still intact enough that you can recognize most of them, what they are, and the wood too. I mean, you can snap a fresh cross section and, and, and tell what the wood is from its anatomy. So um, even though they're burned, they're still recognizable. Great. Well, thank you very much. It looks like we have no more questions, okay. but that was an excellent presentation well, and we really appreciate you. your time oh, tonight. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Thank you and so much. And thank you everyone else for joining us. And um, mark your calendar for October 19th, the next session, which is with uh, Kelsey, uh, Kelsey Hansen and on uh, capturing color. Uh, so look for that on our webpage or Facebook page and have a good evening and stay safe. All right, thank you, Fran. Thanks.